Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's class on uh, tree illustrating using ink and uh, water soluble graphite. Um, this is a two part class. So tonight is part one. And uh, next week, uh, hang on one second. I just realized I didn't think I was spotlighted. Um, uh, next week will be part two. So we're just going to take our time with this one and not uh, rush it. But uh, if you, you know, work um, quickly and maybe follow some of the things that I'll do, you maybe could get uh, farther faster. Um, so I'm gonna give you a couple options to like work fast or work slow uh, with this one. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna switch to my tabletop view and I will go over supplies. Okay, so don't forget to tag your work with those hashtags, make it with Michael's or Michael's classes. And you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. Uh, here's a few of my business cards with some of my work using calligraphy ink. And I'm also on Facebook, Adrian Hodge Fine Art on Facebook. Okay, so this is a really exciting class for me because um, I primarily work with ink, but we're going to be doing a very basic ink technique uh, tonight. The ink is basically going to be this background layer that we're going to create and then we're going to wait for that to dry and we're going to go over it using these water soluble graphite pencils and then we'll splash a little water on there and get them to have this watery effect so this is very much in the style of my work it's something uh, very similar to what i might have up for sale in my studio so um if you you know share any of this on online afterwards I do ask that you please tag me and mention that it is in the style of me, Adrian Hodge, at Adrian Hodge Art on Instagram, or you can do a hashtag Adrian Hodge Art, um, even if you'd like. Um, but if you tag me, I'll be sure to see it and maybe even share it on my page. Um, so yeah, we're using these Faber Castell water soluble, so they're called graphite aquarelle uh, pencils. And I'm sure there are other brands that make the water soluble graphite pencils, but that's the one that we're using. People always wanna know subs, substitutes for things that we can uh, use instead of these. And um, they are very unique in what they do here, but I definitely could say some other things as we're going along that could substitute for, for those. Like one obvious one would be to just use um, pen and ink and then splash some, like use black illustration pens for the darker stuff. And then you could splash in some like uh, black, watered down black ink Okay, so the ink that I'm using today is the Liquitex acrylic ink. And I have the primary set here that came with red, yellow, and blue. But then I also bought an extra color at Michael's. All of this can be purchased at Michael's. Uh, and that is the yellow oxide um, Liquitex acrylic ink. And that was on the supply list. And there were a few different options for ink that you could use instead um, of this. And then I've got the Winsor & Newton white ink as well for how we're going to get these highlights on here later on in part two of the class. And then to mix the uh, water soluble graphite pencils with water and to get them to do this fun, splashy, watered down graphite thing, we're gonna use a couple of paint brushes. I've got a Princeton Aqua Elite size six paintbrush, and I've got a Princeton size one Aqua Elite paintbrush. And uh, then I am gonna be using a third brush to brush on the ink and uh, I have to admit, I left this one off the supply list, but you're going to want a flat brush to do the ink. You can use this round 
your round brush for the ink. If you don't have a brush like this, it's just going to take you a little longer. But that is one thing that I did leave off the, the supply list. And uh, I left one other thing that you probably have laying around the house off the supply list as well. I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but the paper that we're going to be using is the uh, Arches Aquarelle watercolor paper. It's 140 pounds and it's got like a little flip top thing like this. You can use any uh, watercolor paper that you have. It does not have to be the Arches, but Arches is amazing and I highly recommend it. Um, you are going to want a synthetic eraser. I've got a favorite Castell synthetic eraser. You're definitely going to want the reference photo and let me pull that up again real quick here. I included that on the supply list. It looks like this. I'm going to be using it on my iPad here as a reference. And then you will need a water cup or maybe two. One for the ink and one for the uh, water soluble graphite. Although I don't know how far we will get with the uh, watering down the graphite pencils today. We'll see. That will probably come in the second part. Uh, and then you'll want some paper towels to dry our paintbrushes in between use. And in case we have any accidents or spills, it's a lot of supplies, y'all. Hope you're still with me. And then I've got the Artist Loft um, painter's tape, masking tape, or blue painter's tape. Any color, any color painting tape will work fine. And then the last thing that I uh, did not include on the supply list, but you should have something like this lying around your house, um, is a couple of little dishes like this that you don't mind using for ink. Um, I would not use anything that you plan to eat out of just because ink is not the most uh, non-toxic thing out there. Um, so something like this would be good. Or if you want to use a plastic uh, palette, as you know, like you might use for um, any other kind of painting, that would be good as well. Okay, I think that was all the supplies. Are there any questions about the supply list or questions about substitutions we can make? No questions yet. Okay, wow, that's amazing. I figured with that that many things and this kind of a this kind of a painting that there would be somebody wanting to make a substitution. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is get out our piece of watercolor paper, and I've got a couple of options here for you. Remember, so you can either work fast or slow. This is going to be the the slow version. Well, actually, I guess I'll just say both versions really quickly here. Oh my goodness, I just act, here's one thing to be aware of when you're done with this. I think I dripped some of my tea or condensation. Oh yeah, from the water cup when I did that, it put a little ring of water and it made my, my graphite bleed a tiny bit right there, but it just looks like another tree branch, so that's fine. Okay, so see how I've got this nice clean edge all the way around my my little frame here on this paper we are going to first we're going to tape down our paper to our painting surface and we're going to create this background with the ink so if you want to work fast you might get two pieces of paper and do this twice and maybe try it with a couple of different colors and I'll tell you what colors I'm mixing up and I'll make some suggestions for other colors you might use but if you're going to do two of them then I recommend maybe using a different color for each one um, to make it a little more fun so but I'm just going to do one just for the sake of time here Let me turn. Adrian while you're doing that we do have a question that came in okay um, Monica would like to know if she can substitute the pencils for compressed charcoal. Uh, de yes, definitely. But um, if you go to add water to that, you're not going to necessarily have the, the same effect. 
We could definitely blend with charcoal. Yeah, that would be lovely. Okay, so uh, first thing I'm gonna do is tape down this paper and I'm just gonna make my camera go a little higher so you can see we're going portrait with this. So we're going with the, the paper straight up and down and just for the sake of you know you seeing closer to my paper, I'm gonna just keep it like this, but I, I'm gonna shift it around so you'll be able to see every area that I'm working on as I'm working on it, but I'm not gonna be able to show you the whole thing at once, otherwise, I'd have to be farther away. I'm just going to make a little room on my desk to do it that way, actually. And uh, then we're going to take our tape. And I think I might have used some wider tape when I did this. Um, so maybe you could use two strips of tape if you wanted a wider margin like this one. Let's do that. And if you've got a nice wide piece of tape, then you might be able to get a wide margin without doing two layers. We're just gonna tear off a nice long strip that will cover the length of the paper. And we're going to hover half on and half off the paper until we get a nice, even line to happen. So kind of hover for a while before you press it down, make sure it's nice and even so that it's kind of acting a bit like a ruler for you. Uh, you can measure with a ruler and create perfect margins if you are so inclined to do that, but I'm just eyeballing it. And then I'm going to do another layer and I'm basically just using the other piece of tape to line it up. And I kind of overlapped it slightly with the other piece of tape as well. That's a nice wide margin that'll be similar to what I have on the other piece and we're going to do that all the way around on all four sides. And this is one of those things we've done in multiple classes. It is wonderful for a number of reasons. One, it keeps your paper nice and flat as we put a lot of water weight on it here in just a bit. It will keep it from buckling. And then also when we're done, will have this really lovely clean edge all the way around. And it just elevates any work of art, I think, to have this nice clean edge framing it like that. And if you have a piece of cardboard that you could be taping this down to rather than your table surface, that might be a good idea, especially if you do not have a permanent space to work in your in your home if you're working like from a kitchen table surface or something like that where your art projects have to be moved between this week and the next week like i'm taping mine down to this blue uh mat cutter and then that way i can just move it off my desk and have it ready for next week and i don't have to peel it off of my desk if I want to work on a different project between now and then, which I most definitely will. And don't worry about if this is lopsided either, because I think the overall aesthetic of something like this is going to be so strong that if our box is a little lopsided, it's not, it's not going to be the end of the world. And always pull out a ruler and measure if you want to get it. Get it to be more exact. Okay, so you'll do that twice if you're planning to um, do two of these, which I highly recommend because that is something that I do in my studio with my uh, personal work, I rarely work on um, 
just one thing at a time. I will often have two things going at once, if not more, sometimes even up to 10 things at once. And that is because um, ink is a very temperamental material to work with and it's very easy to overwork it. And so if I stick to um, one thing for too long, I tend to overwork it because I'm only human and I have impulses that are hard to control. So if I have multiple things going at once, when I start to feel that like, eh, I'm hitting a wall, something is not quite, you know, like, I don't know what to do next, rather than impulsively doing something I might regret, I can just set that aside, pick up the other one. And usually if I work on more than two things at once, like 10 things at once, I know that sounds extreme, but I tend to end up with pieces I really love at the end of it. Okay, so I made this choice of colors very intentionally because these are uh, colors that I use in my work quite a bit. I love really muted kind of uh, colors that are found in nature, like really, um, you know, earthy greens and uh, warm browns and vivid blues. Those tend to be my go-to color palettes or a lot of times uh, blue and gold are my go-to. So coincidentally, we're going to combine this blue and gold. This is cerulean blue, which is the primary blue, and then this yellow oxide, which looks very gold-like, and it's kind of got this like vintage feeling to it. A lot of my work tends to have like an old photograph quality to it. That's what I tend to go for. So this yellow oxide is just a nice, really uh, muted gold yellow that will tone down any bright color. So if we were to mix this with our red, we're going to get a really cool, like kind of maybe 1970s orange to happen. Um, and then obviously we're going to mix it with our blue and we're going to get this something similar to this green to happen. And you are welcome to maybe if you want to mix like the red and the white that we have together and get like a fun pink, I think would be really nice as an optional background color here. I think a um, and that orange that I mentioned, like mixing this yellow oxide and the red would get you a nice cool uh, vintage orange to happen, or um, maybe even a purple would be nice, or maybe just the blue by itself. Um, the sky's the limit, y'all. Mix these colors however you want, but I think like any two color, any two of these options that we have here is going to give us a nice result. And I know I left the yellow out, but if, you know, if we mix this yellow and this yellow, you'll just get a slightly lighter version, uh, a brighter version of this. So that could be cool too. All right, so I'm going to start with my lighter color first, the yellow oxide. And also I shook these up. If you didn't shake yours up, definitely do that. Make sure the lid's on before you shake them up. I sh shook mine up before the class, but I should mention that if they're brand new out of the box, they might have settled and you might have a lot of liquid uh, like watery separation coming out at first. All right, and then we'll just grab one of our paint brushes. Grab my wash brush and I'm gonna move this aside. And then I'll drop some blue in there. And as I drop it in, I already shook up my blue, but I'm gonna shake it again. Oh, my little dropper is not working on my blue. Okay. Be careful when trying this at home. I totally just spilled it. Hopefully your dropper is working. You don't have to do that. This just adds to the artwork that is my desk. My desk surface has lots of ink spills all over it like that. Okay, so I just did 
I did about three droppers full of the yellow and then one dropper full of the blue. I got a little water on my paintbrush and I'm going to mix those together and see what kind of a green I get. And yeah, I'm getting a really muddy green to happen, which is what I want. If you want a brighter green, you could add a little bit of yellow to this. In fact, let me add a little bit of yellow. I'll brighten it up just a touch. Okay, so that just brightened it up a tiny bit. You can add more of that if you'd like. All right, then we're going to load up our brush and this part we're going to work really fast. So we're just going to go one direction with our paintbrush and we're going to grab some water as we go and we're going to pull this ink around on the page. If you want to watch me do it first before you do it yourself, feel free. I'm going to see how far I can stretch that little bit of ink that I just put on there. And you can go multiple directions if you need to, but the idea is to just stretch this color out across the page as much as possible. And if you feel like you went too heavy or too thick at first, grab some water and drop that water right on top of the heavy or thick, thicker area, and then just keep dragging it across. And if it did get a little heavy, on the edge, you could try to like push the heavier stuff to the edge and create a little bit of a vignette with the heavier brushfuls of ink that happened, but mostly I'm keeping it watered down. And I'll start on the outside edge with the rest of it too, just so that I can keep that vignette thing going. So I'm starting in the bottom corner and then really quickly grabbing my water and dragging it around. faster, the better. You want to get it to be one really seamless big swatch of green or whatever color you're using. And if it gets uneven, if we're aiming for an even spread, but if we get a seam if it isn't seamless and you get a seam somewhere, you can kind of try to paint over the seam real quick while everything's wet and just get it to spread around as much as possible. Or you can maybe grab it out with a paper towel. You can push the heavier stuff to the corners to create that darker vignette. Um, but don't worry about if there are seams because, you know, we're going to be drawing over a lot of this and we can easily cover those things up. Okay. So once we've done that, we're going to stop. We're going to resist the urge to overwork this. And if you just have a lot of ink left and you want to do another one or if you want to try another color and just do it again, whatever floats your boat. Okay, so then I'm going to set this aside. And I'm going to grab some scratch paper so we can practice drawing this tree a little bit. This is really why we needed two hours for this class is because we got to wait for this to dry. It's going to take about 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how heavy you went with your water and your, your ink. I'm just going to fix a few of my seams here real quick. I really don't need a second layer, but I just wanted to fix one seam that was happening. And just by default of doing that, I'm kind of going over it a little bit again. 
I should have just left it alone. Look, I'm talking about not overworking things and then I did it anyway. Sometimes it's good to be the one to overwork things though, as the instructor. All right, so I'm gonna set that aside. And you can just grab some copy paper if you want. I've got it or a sketchbook, whatever you have handy. I realized I did not put that on the, the supply list either. There were a lot of supplies for this one, so hopefully you won't hold it against me. Left-handed here. Okay, we can use the water soluble graphite to sketch. You can use any graphite that you have handy to sketch, but um, using a lighter pencil is always good so that you can erase. Mostly I'm always gonna use a darker pencil in these classes, unless I really need to erase my lines later. Um, because I want you to be able to see my lines showing up on Zoom. So let's grab our reference photo and just take a look at it for a second. One of the things I wanted to focus on in this class is something that we've been talking about over the course of the past <clears throat> two plus months, and that is perspective. So we've spent a lot of time talking about linear perspective these last couple of months. We've gone through one point perspective and two point perspective. And we have talked about atmospheric perspective uh, quite a bit um, in many classes. And uh, this class, we're really going to focus on the atmospheric perspective that we're seeing on this forest floor. So we've got a very clear uh, separation between our foreground, our middle ground, and our background. And when we're looking at these trees, our tree that is right up front and nice and big, that's our foreground tree. We don't have a tree really in the middle ground, but we do have lots of leaves that we can observe. And the leaves in the foreground are nice and big. They're very close to the actual size of how the leaves would appear if they were right in front of us. Um, and then the leaves that are here in the middle ground, they're a little smaller. They're less distinct. We can't see like the little veins or the um, stem on the center of the leaves. All we see as we get to the middle ground here is more of these abstracted organic shapes of lights and darks that the the leaves are uh, showing up as in the photo. And then in the very background here, these leaves are really blurry. They're very small. Some of them might be as small as little dots, or uh, we might represent them more as a whole, as like a few scribbles back here, or like little dots of highlights and shadows, versus here, we're going to draw the shape of a leaf. So we're really introducing uh, this idea of atmospheric perspective here by showing how things overlap, uh, things in the foreground overlap things in the middle ground and the background, things in the middle ground will overlap things in the background, et cetera. And same thing with the uh, fungi, the mushrooms on the side of the tree here, the ones that are closer to us at the bottom are nice and round. We've got lots of details on them. We can see some little, you know, moments of like dirt and uh, what have you on the, the surface of them. But the ones that are a little farther away from us, we see just kind of more the large, you know, the shape of the, the mushroom and the shape of the light and the shadow there. And then the ones that are really small, we might just represent them more as dots, uh, ones that are smaller and that are farther away from us as they're getting farther away and going higher up the tree. So like, just take note of the fact that this tree in the foreground is 
probably very similar in size to this tree in the background that's far away, but it appears much smaller, less distinct, kind of blurry. We're just going to represent those trees in the background more as like shapes of shadows and light, and we're going to try to fuzz and blur them out as much as possible. Same thing with the leaves that are farther away from us. And by doing that, we're going to create quite a sense of depth in this, this little painting. And we're going to be using a lot of implied lines. So we're not going to put a whole lot of detail on, um, on any one part of this. Um, but you can always add more detail if you'd like and make yours more detailed. Uh, okay, so Let's just start sketching this tree. Oops, some blue paint escaped from my desk and made its way to that paper. The page. There was a class very early on in this uh, series. I've been doing these classes with Michael's since uh, July 2021 and about August and September 2021 we did uh, a class on a value study of drawing a tree we actually did it twice so um, the same class you can find it twice on YouTube and I believe uh, our lovely moderator Chanel has that link and she's dropping it in the chat for you now it was de developing value drawing skills um with a, a tree drawing and i provided a photo of that one and basically we just talked about the contours of the tree and how to uh represent you know the cylindrical nature of a tree using contour lines and then how we can again use implied line to get more detail on things that are closer to us and less detail on things that are farther away but also just only putting some details in some places on a tree is a good policy because you can really suggest the idea of a tree by only putting details in uh, select places and not necessarily having to draw the entire thing. Okay, so we're gonna start out with our just overall tree shape. And if you wanna start with like a cylinder first to help yourself find that cylindrical tree shape. I'm just going to sketch the bottom of a cylinder here. That would be like what's on the other side of the tree that we can't see. And this would be the contour lines of that cylinder. So we've got a round line for the horizontal axis and we've got a straight line for the vertical axis and that would go all the way around our cylinder to give us all of our contours of the tree. So keep that in mind as we're sketching here. That's just my one little preview of what's in that drawing a tree class. If your drawing skills need a lot of help, you can go check out that, that class that we just linked. Okay, but I'm just going to sketch just a very loose outline of this tree in the foreground. And I'm paying very close attention to the shapes that I'm seeing at the bottom. This little ink tray out of the way. Too many supplies in this class. So I'm sketching the shapes that I'm seeing at the bottom where the leaves are covering up the roots. So I see something like that. It maybe feels like the bottom of a dinosaur uh, foot, something like that. And then I'm leaving it open on the edge there. And as soon as our ink is dry, this is what we're going to draw again using these water soluble graphite pencils. Okay, and then I'm going to look for the shapes of the heavier shadows that I'm seeing on, on the tree trunk here. 
So there's a big shape of a shadow here in the foreground where the mushrooms Let me turn off one of my lights. I think it might that better or worse. I feel like sometimes my light actually washes out my pencil lines on screen. It'll get darker the more I add, I add to it, by the way. So give me just a moment here. So I'm just sketching in the organic shape of this shadow that I'm seeing around the mushrooms. There's a big organic shape like that. And then same thing over here. And then we'll just go ahead and dive in and start putting some of these mushrooms in because we want to take into account all of the overlapping that's happening here with the, the mushrooms and the, the tree itself. So I'm looking for these little half circle shapes is basically what it is. And then we need a shadow under each, each one. And some of the shadows are connected there was creating that larger shadowy shape that we just drew. So think about like a fan. You want to really make it feel like it's attached to the tree. So you want a little bit of a curved edge there where it's attached to the tree, but it's not a perfectly little curved half circle. It's kind of looks straight in some places. Maybe think of like a Christmas tree skirt, how they spread out across the floor. We're looking for that sort of a shape. And so if there are any mycologists in the audience, I'd love to know what type of mushroom this is because I do not know as fascinated as I am by mushrooms. Toadstools and all things whimsical and storybook in nature. I don't know what type of mushrooms these are. Chanel, if somebody says it in the chat and it seems right, <laughs> if they seem really confident, I'd love to know. I feel like maybe they're, I've heard of oyster mushrooms. Is that a thing? Because they kind of feel like oysters, right? I might be making that up. Okay, so I'm just getting, I feel like my light is putting a glare on it, but I'm just putting these little skirts and or sand dollars and or clamshells, however you want to uh, refer to them that makes it easier to draw that shape. And then for each one, we want to think about the reverse of that and the shadow that we're seeing underneath it. And then notice what the shadow is doing. It's probably creating a, not like a perfect echo of the shape, but you know, it's acting as a little umbrella on a big portion of the tree bark underneath it. So it's not Monica good. says they're shelf mushrooms. Shelf mushrooms. Okay, that sounds right. Let's go with Monica. Cool. Okay, so our shadow is going to be sort of like that underneath each one, but they're going to blur and blend together. And we'll get some different sizes of them in there. Some of them are shaped more like little bells than they are, or like little Hershey's Kisses. There's a number of different ways we can think of things. And I feel like that is always helpful to me when I'm trying to draw a shape like this, for whatever reason, calling it something other than what it is makes it easier to draw the shape. I think it's just a psychological thing. Sometimes we tell ourselves certain subject matter is hard to draw, but giving it a different name can just take the, the fear or intimidation away somehow. We don't have to draw every single one, maybe just draw the ones that are the most interesting to you and then just repeat that shape a few times around it and you're going to have something that feels similar to what we're looking at here in the photograph. And then we want to draw some of the details on some of the bark. So. Uh, 
again, I'm looking for the irregular shapes here of the, the bark and the shadows in between them and giving them a name other than what they are can be really helpful. So like a soft rectangle in some places. Um, some of them feel like, like states on a map, country and region shape. So just notice what they're doing, but overall they're gonna be a lot of rectangles with irregular um, shapes to them or triangulated points that overlap repeatedly like this. And then within those, we're gonna have these heavier shadows. And try not to get too attached to your lines as you go here, if, um, or, you know, later when we're drawing this again on the, the ink. So if you've drawn it once, you can draw it again. I know sometimes people get impatient with uh, the process of something like this, where we're spending all this time drawing it on scratch paper, and then maybe you fall in love with your drawing on the scratch paper, and then you've got to draw it again on the on top of the ink once it's dry and then maybe you're having some fear that you're not going to be able to draw it again and I guarantee you 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 can if you drew it once you can draw it again it's not a fluke practice is something that can make us improve with our skills over time although it does happen sometimes where you draw it you draw it in a certain way that first time I get it. It does. It does happen. So maybe just, you know, pause here and wait, you know, and draw it on the, the ink when you're ready. And speaking of, let me see if my ink is dry. Not quite. I said 10 or 15 minutes and it's taken a little longer. I think I added a little too much water with that second layer. So I'm just going to keep working on the scratch paper. So next week, um, I will probably do this very quickly again on top of the uh, the inked paper that we prepared. And um, you know, if I go too quickly, then you can always go back and watch this more slowed down version of the sketch. But uh, next week, we'll start with getting it on the dried surface of the paper, since I know we're, we're running out of time today. But we'll just keep going with the scratch paper. And then if in between now and next week, if you want to sketch it again on your ink paper and not wait for me, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. OK, so let's talk about these leaves in the foreground again. We took a look at them and observed them. But now we want to try to draw them with more detail in the foreground and less detail uh, as we go back in space. Um, first, we've got a really interesting little mushroom right down there in the little corner here. So that's a good one to add because it's in an interesting spot and our eyes might go straight to that one. When we're done here. So one of the, my tips and tricks for what I do in my my artwork that I think gives it that kind of wow factor is the implied line thing that I do so much of. And I've had years of practice. I like to say it's like a really cool person who spent many hours throwing, you know, planning an outfit that makes it look like they just threw on their clothes in five minutes, but we all know a lot more effort went into it than that, right? So when we can sketch things nice and loose in this kind of devil may care way, and it feels just effortless, know that lots and lots of years of practice have gone into it to be able to draw it effortlessly like that. So one way to loosen up if you're you know kind of stiff and you're not able to get these looser lines to happen is to just do some figure eights with your pencil to try to loosen up or just doing um, lots and lots of repetitive sketching also helps um, but my trick my other trick besides 
being nice and loose and uh, spending years practicing is I hone in on one or two things. Like we've got this mass of leaves, right? And it can be extremely daunting to try to draw a big pile of leaves like this. Uh, same thing with these mushrooms can feel really daunting or the tree bark, but we just did it, right? And we didn't draw every single detail on every one. And if we did, we might be frustrated later when we add our water to it because it's going to bleed some of that detail out with the water soluble graphite. So we're just going to look for like some very interesting moments on these leaves. Pick like three or four leaves that you can really focus on. So like maybe this one right here and this one and this one and this one. It doesn't matter which one, um, but I'm going to just sketch like four leaves in this image in a very thoughtful way. So I'm looking at that one right there. And if it helps to call it something else, like it kind of feels like an alligator head, that might be helpful or like a bird beak at the end of it. And then I'm looking for like those veins in it and like noticing what the contours do. And maybe I'll even add a little bit of value to it on top of that with the using the side of my pencil to shade a little bit. And then I'll look for another leaf over here with an interesting shape. So I'm looking at this one now and I'm getting a little more detail in that one. I'm noticing what the veins are doing, what the contours of that leaf are, and really getting in there and putting some, some value and attention. So I'm kind of moving around here and I'm leaving some space if it seems like something's overlapping on top of that leaf, then I'll, I'm looking at that one now. And they don't have to be perfect. We're just getting some more thoughtful leaf shapes in there. And let's do one more, one of these rounded ones. All right, there we did it. We drew four leaves, okay? And then the rest of this, we're gonna just look for shapes of dark and light. So these sort of irregular little keyhole shapes of dark that are showing up, of black shadows that are happening in between. And then maybe some of the lighter shapes that we're seeing some other leaves, but we're going to be really loose and scribbly with these. In fact, some of these are just going to be like little half triangles around and maybe we'll do one more over here. I feel like we need a little bit more detail on this side too, but we don't need much. Okay, and then we're going to start going back in space here with our leaves. There's one other thing that's kind of close enough to give it some detail. There's like a piece of wood right here on the, the side of the tree. So I'll get that in there and the, the shadows underneath it. But these leaves that are getting farther away from us now we're only going to do the little keyhole thing. We're only going to do the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the light. And then as we go farther and farther back, and then we're going to get a little smaller with our shapes too.
And then as we go further and further back, they're going to get even less distinct. And then once we get to where we're at the about the level of these tinier shapes on the the mushrooms on the side of the tree here. Let's go about when we're two thirds of the way up in our image, we'll go ahead and put our little line at the bottom of the background trees in and it angles down slopes down and then back here we're just going to do very little like little bigger than dots little circles for these leaves. And these are the shadowy shapes of light and dark that I'm seeing on the trees that are, or sorry, on the leaves that are much farther away. And then you can kind of meet somewhere in the middle with your small, medium, and large, you know, let them get like slightly bigger as they approach the size that you made them in the middle ground. And then in between those, we're just going to kind of scribble in, but we want to scribble in something that feels like, like it's all connected, almost like water. So that's what's making it feel like this bed of leaves is all connected on this little hill. Okay. And I think I'm going to save the background trees for next time. And with my last minute of instruction here, I was using a 6B in these uh, water soluble graphites. I'm going to take my 8B, my darkest one, and I'm just go ahead and start filling in with the side of my pencil some of these darker shadows just to make it come to life a little bit more here. I'm using the side of the pencil. And I'm being very mindful to like kind of blend it out as I go. And also this is going to look different on the watercolor paper, like the tooth of the watercolor paper is going to hold this graphite different than a piece of scratch paper or um, sketchbook paper, drawing paper is. So keep that in mind. Um, let me see if I'm, my ink is dry yet. It's pretty dry, but it still feels a little cold. So I'm not ready to draw on it yet. I'm afraid if I try to draw on it just yet, uh, it will kind of be a little, it, the texture will be funny. It's not gonna pick it up the way I want it to. So I really need that to be totally dry. And maybe I miss, underestimated how long it takes ink to dry. Maybe because I'm so used to working on multiple things at once, or maybe because I lose track of time when I'm working in the studio, but that was definitely more than <laughs> 10 or 15 minutes over here for this ink to dry. So, uh, but next time it'll be totally dry and we'll be able to, you know, easily sketch on top of our, our ink swatches that we made. You could go ahead and even peel off the tape as soon as it's dry, because we shouldn't be going uh, to the edge with our water soluble graphite too much. But if you want to keep it taped down, you're welcome to. Um, and yeah, next week, I'll just quickly sketch this again on, uh, on top of my dried ink surface. And then we'll use the paint brushes to bleed it out. We'll add our highlights with the uh, white ink. We'll go back in with the water soluble uh, graphite at the end and add some details on top in black to kind of add it more interesting texture. I'd love to see Adrian, you cut out for me. I don't know if you're still there.
Um, okay. I think she left, but I'm gonna give her just like 30 seconds to see if she comes back, okay? Oh, there she is. Sorry about that, everyone. My electricity just flashed on and off for a second there. Um, I'm glad it came back so quickly. So all, all I was saying, I was right at the end. I was gonna <laughs> say I'd love to see um, what everybody else created tonight. If you'd like to hold up your uh, your sketch, and then I'd love to see if you use some different colors too. So if you want to hold up your sketch and your you know swatch of, of color, mine's kind of big to hold up. So I understand if it's hard to hold it up, but um, no can spotlight you. You can see your sketches and your ink backgrounds. Okay, that one's nice and light, which is good. That means you're keeping it light until you're ready to add some things, more details, but it's kind of hard to see. Hmm, I saw a little bit of it there. Okay. So thank you for sharing. I wish the light was a little better there to spotlight you. Um, oh yes, that's nice. Okay, we got a, a lot of values going there. We're taking our time with those leaves. It's looking good, those mushrooms. So if we get the mushrooms at the bottom to be nice and big and then getting smaller as they go up, it'll create that uh, illusion of depth even more. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Is that it? Okay, well, that's fine. We might have lost a lot of people when the power thing happened. I appreciate those of you who stuck around. Um, I'm glad that happened at the end of class and not earlier on. Okay, well, thank you all so much. And I'm looking forward to part two. And feel free to share anything with me um, in between. Uh, thank you and have a great night.